Uh, good morning or uh, good uh, afternoon to all of you. I'm Ricardo Della Favera. I'm a professor at Columbia University, and uh, I will chair today the symposium on behalf of the Foundation for Italian Scientists and Scholars of North America in occasion of their uh, one of their awards. Uh, six awards every year are uh, uh, awarded by ISNAF in various disciplines and are targeted to outstanding early career Italian researcher working in the United States or Canada, recognizing their significant and innovative contribution in the field of research. The uh, award uh, symposium that uh, uh, I'll be chairing today is uh, for the uh, ISNAF Young Investigator Paola Campese Award for research in hematologic malignancies. This award was established uh, uh, in 2011 by Stefani and Vito Campese in memory of their uh, young, uh, beloved, talented uh, daughter, uh, Paola. In, every, in, like for any of the six awards uh, uh, delivered by ISNAF, there is a process uh, that involved uh, a, an award review board that selects uh, the three finalists among uh, all the applicants. And then in occasion of a symposium, the award jury selects a winner among the three fin finalists. And that is the um, uh, occasion we are uh, dealing with uh, today. Uh, the, uh, I, the symposium will involve three presentation by the three finalists. This is gonna be an audience uh, and uh, there will be presentation followed by questions, and the question can be entered in the Zoom question and, uh, and uh, answer uh, chat. I think we can then deal, uh, start with the presentations, which uh, will uh, occur in uh, alphabetical order by the three finalists. The first uh, will be uh, Elisa Mandato from Dana Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, the title of a presentation will be Targetable Vulnerabilities in Genetically Defined Diffuse Large B-Cell Lymphoma Subset. Before, and while Elisa starts, I think I forgot to tell you who is the jury. The jury is chaired by myself and it's composed also by Professor Simona Colla from the uh, MD Anderson Cancer Research Center in Houston and I, Professor Laura Pasqualucci, who is a professor at Columbia University also. If uh, 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 Guido Ghilardi is ready, he can start loading his presentation. Few mistakes. Okay, I, I share the screen. And the title is Improving uh, Chimeric Antigen Receptor T-Cell Therapy Against Lymphoma. Guido Ghilardi was at University of Philadelphia, University of Pennsylvania. Okay. Good morning to everybody. And I want to thank all the uh, organizer and the selection committee for the uh, prestigious Paola Campes Award for uh, selecting me as a finalist of uh, this uh, uh, award with my project. It is trying to improve chimeric antigen receptor T-cells for lymphomas. Before to start uh, to talk about my uh, project, I want to give you a brief introduction of myself. I study medicine in Novara, it is a, as you know, is a small town in northern Italy, but mostly famous for the best cheese in the world, that is Gorgonzola. And uh, over these years, I, um, I developed a strong interest uh, in lymphomas, and for this reason, I joined the uh, Oncology Institute of South Switzerland, uh, where uh, uh, that is a well uh, uh, worldwide renowned center for the treatment of such disease. And I was lucky because there is also very good cheese in Switzerland. However, over the years of my uh, fellowship, a revolution began in the treatment options for, the, for uh, lymphomas with the advent of chimeric antigen receptor T cells for both acute lymphoblastic leukemia and lymphomas, with more and more products uh, becoming available commercially available over the past year, and the University of Pennsylvania being a pioneer and one of the leading centers for the development of such uh, immune therapy. And for this reason, I decided to move to Philadelphia in 2020 during COVID, uh, where I started my postdoctoral training. 
And yeah, I was lucky because uh, Philadelphia is famous as well for cheese. However, let's talk about chimerican VR receptor T cells. Chimerican TGI receptor is a hybrid receptor that is uh, constituted by the fusion of uh, the antigen binding portion of a monoclonal anti of, a, of an antibody with the intercellular component of the T cell receptor. And uh, the resulted hybrid receptor is then able to, uh, uh, to uh, detect uh, antigens in their uh, specific antigens uh, on their native conformation and uh, trigger and stimulate uh, T cells to perform their, their cytotoxic activity against tumor cells. And uh, how we uh, generate this kind of therapy? Well, we take an antiviral vector containing the information to, uh, of the car. We infuse, uh, we, uh, we infect the patient T cells to, uh, with this uh, car construct, then uh, they will start to express on their surface the car. And then these car T cells are infused back into the patient where they will find the tumor cell and destroy them. However, even if, uh, as I mentioned, car T cell, uh, uh, car -T -cell therapy provided a uh, high response rate in most of the patients, Still, up to 70% of, of uh, large B-cell lymphoma patients are still destined to relapse over time and or are refractory. And also, most of these of this patients experience severe toxicities, including uh, cytokine releasing syndrome and uh, immune effector associated neurotoxicities that are both the results of the huge uh, really, uh, uh, secretion of uh, inflammatory cytokines induced by the engagement of CAR T-cells to tumor cells. And uh, these toxicities that, uh, as you may see, are different according to the commercial product, still affect and put at risk the uh, life of, of patients and preclude this treatment uh, to freight population. So if we want to improve chimeric antigen T-cells, we have to take care of both of these products, the overcoming the resistance mechanism, but also trying to tune the toxicities related to this uh, treatment. And that's exactly the focus of my postdoctoral research, trying to uh, evaluate all the features of CAR T-cell immune therapy in order to generate, a uh, in order to find solution to improve, uh, to improve this treatment, because uh, CAR T-cell is the most complex uh, living drug produced so far. And we have to think about uh, all the aspects of, uh, of this therapy if we want to improve it. And I'm talking about the pre barriers because this is an extremely expensive uh, treatment, but also the status of the patient at the cartesian infusion uh, directly affect the uh, onset and the, the outcome of uh, such therapy, but also the characteristic of the product, it's, uh, the characteristic of the product infused and the resistant mechanism intrinsic of the tumor but also the uh, characterization of tumor maker environment. Altogether, they, uh, they are able to determine the fate of, of uh, this immune therapy. Over the past four years, I studied, uh, um, I studied all of these uh, aspects in uh, several uh, projects in collaboration. And today I will present you uh, two of them. And in particular, let's start with the first one that is a project evaluating the tumor intrinsic mechanism, in particular the antigen loss. Antigen loss or antigen negative escape, well, uh, Usually, uh, all the lymphoma cells are CD19 positive, and therefore, CD19 is the target of all the commercially available carnitin products. However, if within the tumor mass there are some, even a small proportion of CD19 negative cells, well, these cells are invisible to the, car to the car 19 activity, and they will survive. They will survive, and then they will proliferate and generate a CD19 negative relapse that is insensitive to any future um, activity of CAR-19. This phenomenon is well known for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, but is not well studied in lymphoma. And so in this project, we evaluated 26 biopsies of uh, tisogen of, uh, of uh, uh, relapse after tisogen leclosel, that is one of the commercially available product. And we observed that up to 40% of patients relapse as a CD19 negative uh, clones. So we uh, decided to study additional B cell marker in order to generate, a po in order to find a possible antigen to be targeted with a new car in order to um, overcome antigen negative resistance. 
But we observed that uh, while CD20 was uh, still negative uh, at the time of relapse, in up to 20% of the cases as, as a result of uh, exposure to uh, rituximab over the first signs of therapy, all the relapsed cases were positive for CD79. And therefore, we decided to generate and uh, optimize a new anti-CD79 car to match with CAR19 in a dual, in a dual CAR T cell platform in order to try to overcome the antigen negative escape. To do that, we generated an antigen negative escape tumor model in which we took HPL1, HPL1 that is a, a large B cell lymphoma cell line. We knocked out the expression of CD19 or CD7 or CD79B, and the two generated cell lines were then mixed in a one-on-one -on -one ratio and subcutaneously uh, injected in uh, NSG mice that then we, uh, would be treated with uh, either untransfused T cells, CAR19, and worker T cells. And uh, as you see, over time, the mice treated with the worker T cells were, uh, were the mice that had a better tumor control compared to the other two groups. Also, when we evaluated the phenotype of the relapsed tumor, as expected, the untransfused uh, T cell treated mice show both uh, the, uh, the, two the, the two population, but the mice treated with carmentine relapsed with a single uh, population that was CD19 uh, negative as expected, but this confirmed that, uh, an that uh, antigen negative escape, in particular CD19 negative escape, uh, is an effective strategy to overcome uh, the, the, the activity of carmentine. And however, I cannot show you the uh, relapse uh, after the dual care pieces because uh, so far no mice relapsed in the dual care pieces group. So confirming that uh, our dual care pieces approach is effective as a strategy for uh, to treat and prevent antigen negative escape. Then I want to talk about my second, the second project that is mainly focused on tuning the toxicity of K19 by modifying the lymphodepletion regimen. Lymphodepletion is a key component of CAR T cell immune therapy and is usually compo uh, composed by the administration of uh, uh, chemotherapy over the week before CAR 19 infusion in order to remove uh, the, host and, uh, and the host energy lymphocytes and uh, increase the biodisponibility bio uh, of uh, uh, lymphocyte stimulating cytokines that will help uh, the new infused CAR T cells to engraft and proliferate inside the host. All the three commercially available preventing products use a combination of fludarabine and cetophosphamide as a standard lymphodepletion measurement. However, bendamastin is a chemotherapeutic agent that share, it is a structure and mechanism of action similar to both fludarabine and cetophosphamide, but is known to be associated with a reduced, uh, with a reduced hematological toxicity. Mm -hmm. And for this reason, the University of Pennsylvania started to treat uh, the CAR T cell uh, treated patient with bendamastin lymphodepletion. And uh, last year, we uh, published our first analysis in analysis of oncology where we compared the two lymphodepletion regimen before T cell genetic cell, that is one of the commercial available product, in a large cohort of large B cell lymphoma across three different institutions. And uh, as you see, both the overall response rate and progression for survival were similar according, uh, irrespectively of the lymphodepletion regimen. But interestingly, both CRS and ICANS were reduced in patients receiving mendamastin lymphodepletion compared to fludarabine cetophosphamide. We then evaluated also the uh, hematological toxicities, and as expected, patients receiving fludarabine cetophosphamide had a drastically reduced level of both neutrophil hemoglobin levels and platelet, and this translates in a higher risk to develop infections and metropenic fever. So in this uh, analysis, we uh, demonstrated that bendamastin was a safer uh, lymphodepletion regimen before this agenda to cell. And given these results, more centers around the world started to change their clinical practice and now are using bendamastin lymphodepletion uh, routinely. However, we still have uh, uh, unsolved question uh, with this study. First, uh, if uh, bendamastin lymphodepletion is an effective strategy and safe strategy, also in the setting of other carnitine products, and in particular axicaptogen serial cell, which is the most toxic uh, carnitine product available up to date. And also, what are the mechanisms underlying the reduced uh, incidence of CRS and ICANS in patients treated with bendamastin lymphodepletion? To solve the first question, we analyzed a second cohort of axi cell treated patients at the University of Pennsylvania, and we confirmed that uh, um, the response rate 
was similar irrespectively of the lymph depletion rate we administered, but still we, keep, uh, we observed again a reduction in the level in the incidence of CRS and ICANS in patients receiving lymphomastin lymph depletion. And again, lymphomastin lymph depletion was associated with a milder uh, hematological toxicities and also reduced infection and neutropenic fever events. We then evaluated uh, um, the possible mechanism of the reduced uh, toxicities observed in lymphomastin lymph depletion by evaluating the cytokine and metabolites changing induced by the lymph depletion. And uh, as, as you may see, while both the lymph depletion regimen uh, were able to increase the levels of the lymphocyte stimulating cytokines, such as uh, IL-15, IL-2, and IL-7, through the insect of osomite treated patients uh, had a higher increase in the level of all the inflammatory cytokines by the time of Cartesian infusion, and in particular of IL-15, IL-8, and MCP-1, which are uh, cytokines previ uh, previously associated with uh, the, uh, the pathogenesis and the severity of both CRS and ICANS. So this data uh, confirmed that, uh, um, confirmed that, lympho that lympho depletion regimen can directly contribute to the pathogenesis of cartes specific toxicities. We then evaluated... Yeah. Yep, thank you. We then evaluated also the changes in the metabolites according to the lympho depletion, and we observed that patients receiving fludarabine cyclophosphamide had a reduction in the circulating level of anabolic metabolites, but also reduced level of uh, uh, antioxidant metabolites, including nicotinamide ribose and ADH. And we speculated that this reduction may be the result of a faster utilization of such metabolites to, uh, re uh, to reconstitute the physiological levels of circulating uh, elements and uh, is leave the, pa leave the patient more vulnerable to additional metabolic stress, and so may mm, contribute in the end to the pathogenesis of uh, systemic inflammation. So with this project, we, uh, we confirmed, we observed that CDN negative relapse occurs in about 30% of patients, and the, our dual CAR T cell is, could be an effective strategy to, uh, uh, to uh, avoid, uh, to overcome antigen negative escape, and we are now optimizing our product that will be hopefully then uh, evaluated in a phase one clinical trial soon. And also we confirm that vendamastin lymph depletion is an effective strategy in, uh, for, in, for a much kidney lymphoma patient, both uh, before tisagen leclocell and axicel, and uh, was associated with reduced uh, incidence of CRS, ICANS, infection rate, and cytopenia. And finally, we demonstrated that, the food, that uh, lymph depletion directly contribute to the pathogenesis of cartesia related toxicity. And I want to thank a lot of people, you for your attention, but also all the members in, in my lab, Marco Ella, all the members that uh, when I joined this laboratory we were a very small lab with five people and uh, this picture was taken uh, two days ago and as you see now we are pretty a lot and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Guido. And now the presentation is open for questions, uh, both for the present attendance and the one on the online of the webinar, who should use the question and answer mode. Laura, has a question? Yes. Thank you very much for, for your nice presentation. I wanted to ask you whether you think that in the HBL1 cell line that you use in your mouse model for the double treatment, there may be also an influence in the results due to the fact that this cell line has mutations activating CD7, the B cell receptor and CD79B and, uh, and is dependent, uh, highly dependent on this uh, signaling pathway. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, it's a very good question. Yeah, these results, uh, today show you the results with HPL1, but actually we have, uh, uh, we have similar results also with uh, other cell lines, including um, OCLY18. And uh, however, these cell lines, uh, uh, so we, uh, when we silenced the expression of uh, uh, CD79, they were still pretty healthy. And uh, so they, the proliferation was similar both with uh, uh, the silencing uh, with the, the, the knockout of CD19 or CD79. So in, 
for uh, this type of uh, uh, for in this model, it, it, the, the, yeah, it didn't uh, uh, impact that much the mutation of CD79. I have a question that partially re related to Laura's question. So can, can you elaborate a bit on the selection of the second marker, 70, CD79? Has anything to do with the fact that there could be all lymphoma cells may be dependent on BCR receptor signaling and therefore there may be no selection for CD79 negative cells? How generally do you think will be, this will be? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, actually, um, exactly as uh, CD19, CD when we, uh, if we want to, uh, to overcome the antigen negative escape, we have to exactly focus our uh, uh, target with something that the cells uh, are dependent on. So targeting CD79 theoretically should, uh, should ensure us that uh, the expression of CD79 is preserved at any stage of and uh, lines of therapy uh, before our dual CAR T cell approach. Um, we are evaluating also other targets, such as, uh, um, for example, as I, as I showed, CD20, but also CD22. And but uh, CD79 is uh, is uh, the the more stable one, the most the more reliable one, the most reliable one among the, all the recent markets. And yeah. Do you have at least in vitro data that shows how general is dependency on C CD79 in DLBCL subtypes, GCB, ABC? Uh, no, we didn't. Uh, we did not. Uh, we didn't generate data about the dependency of CD79 in our models because uh, because uh, both uh, in uh, in vitro and in vivo uh, with. Uh, uh, when we treat them with uh, with cartesis, the the the, cyt the cytotoxic activity of cartesis is uh, uh, pretty potent and very fast. So uh, it's kind of, uh, the the effect in the end is uh, all, all or nothing in the end. So the cells has not much time to uh, to uh, show their dependency uh, on the on the survivability with uh, the. Uh, based on the 17 on the 17 mutation and uh, in stimulation pathways because they are directly killed by the T cells if uh, the T cells will find the target. Okay. Any other question for Guido? Did you try the uh, just out of curiosity? So you use cell line, but did you try the dual uh, CAR T in xenograft uh, developed uh, by using a patient sample? Uh, we are evaluating uh, to use a xenograft. Uh, we have uh, we have a couple of xenograft. Unfortunately, uh, we we were unlucky, and uh, up to date, we were not able to generate yet a patient derived xenograft model relapsed after CAR nineteen that was CD nineteen negative. So, but we maybe are working yeah. with. But instead of uh, using the relapse sample, can you just use uh, the uh, the baseline? I know that just as a model to try to understand uh, how possible, uh, uh, like in patient, right? Uh, yeah. if you, so if you use the baseline and not the relapse, uh, can you model the relapse in the mice? Uh, possibly this mice relapse by generating CAR T negative, uh, sorry, uh, CD19 negative clone. Yeah. And maybe both uh, in this case, also 79 negative clone. I'm not sure I understood my question. <laughs> it's just a model to see how they could uh, eventually relapse again uh, if you target both of them. I'm I mean, that's a very good question. We didn't look at uh, this type of model yet, but uh, yeah, it's a very good suggestion. And uh, we because I guess that you will have a lot of clone inside, right? I mean, you exactly. will have the major clone, but possible you have other clone inside that may be resistance even to the dual inhibitor. Maybe could be, this could be monitoring now. Exactly. In the... Yeah, yeah um, absolutely, 100%. Our tumor model was, uh, uh, yeah, was uh, pretty artificial, but also want to stress uh, it was one that the main focus of our model was exactly that to stress the the 
from the, the different clones inside that tumor mass. Uh, there are multiple mechanisms that uh, take uh, uh, that uh, occur, that of course uh, during a during the CAR T cell reaction to a tumor mass, including the antigen uh, the antigen spread uh, after the engagement of CAR. So I think that uh, especially in the mouse model, the uh, in special mouse model that are more artificial, of course, than I. Uh, to appreciate, to really appreciate the uh, the selection of clones, uh, um, we we need a decent amount of uh, of uh, antigen negative clones. Um, but I think that uh, yeah, it's a good idea, and uh, we we evaluate to perform a study like uh, with the primary tumor, uh, primary patient samples, absolutely. Very nice, congratulations. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions. I think we'll move on. Thank you very much, Guido. Thank you. Thanks. The next presentation from uh, Dr. Elisa Mandato, who is an instructor of medicine at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute at Harvard University. The title, Targetable Vulnerabilities in Genetically Defined Diffuse Large B-Cell Lymphoma Subsets. Uh, Elisa? Thank you. Um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Um, so uh, thank you. First of all, uh, I want to say it's a great pleasure and, and honor to have been selected among the finalists and uh, to be able to share some of the results of my research today. Um, as Professor Dalla Favera says, uh, um, the main focus of my study is diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, which is the most common type of lymphoid malignancy in adults. And the frontline treatment is currently RCHOP, which is a combination of the anti CD20 antibody rituximab plus combination chemotherapy. However, about 35% of patients uh, relapse or develop refractory disease, uh, and these patients usually have a dismal outcome. This lymphoma is characterized by a high degree of transcriptional heterogeneity, which uh, uh, has been captured by gene expression profile analysis, which were able to reveal a substructure in patients with this uh, lymphoma. In particular, the cell of origin classification uh, has been able to define three different subtypes of the LBCL on the basis of the similar gene expression profile with the cell of origin, uh, defining uh, two uh, main subgroups, uh, the germinal center B-cell-like and the activated B-cell-like. However, this uh, uh, transcriptional heterogeneity does not capture the high level of genetic heterogeneity in this disease. Uh, our group uh, has put together uh, mutations, uh, copy number alterations, and the structural variants uh, in a large cohort of the LBCL samples, and was able to define five distinct uh, clusters, uh, each characterized uh, by a specific genetic signature. Um, as you can see, both cluster one and cluster five are enriched in the ABC subtype of the LBCL, which is the one with the worst overall survival after standard chemotherapy. Um, however, if we look into the ABC enriched tumors, we can see that the cluster five have significantly less progression free survival as compared to cluster one. Uh, recently, a phase one clinical trial uh, has evidenced the benefit of adding uh, ibrutinib to standard chemotherapy for younger patients uh, with the ABC subtype of the LBCL. And a subsequent genomic analysis of these patients included in the study has helped to identify their molecular signature and then link this signature to the differential response to therapy. And as you can see from these uh, uh, survival curves, uh, selectively younger patients with the cluster 5 or MCD because of the concurrent alterations of MyD88 and CD79B show a benefit from the addition uh, of ibrutinib to standard chemotherapy without significant differences for cluster 1 patients, which are also known as the BN2 subgroups because of the concurrent mutations of BCL6 and the NOTCH2 pointing out that uh, um, the molecular classification is really predictive of the outcome. Uh, 
And my work starts exactly from these identified genetic alterations uh, uh, in order to define a novel specific targetable vulnerabilities for specific subsets of the LPCL. In particular, in cluster five, uh, we identified the frequent and concurrent alterations of CD79B and MyD88. CD79B is a molecule associated with uh, the B cell receptor complex, and the most common alterations substitute the tyrosine 196 to eliminate this phosphorylation site. And as a consequence of this, mutated isoforms can potentiate the downstream B cell receptor signaling. My D88 instead is uh, an adapter in the toll like receptor signaling, and uh, the canonical L265P mutation enhances the interaction with the receptor and induces constitutive and FK D activation. Therefore, we asked uh, what's the benefit for these concurrent alterations for cluster 5 patients. And for many, many years, it was thought that the TLR and the BCR signaling only converge distally at the level of NFKD activation. However, uh, more recent uh, uh, research has evidenced the existence of a uh, um, multiprotein complex of wildtap MyD88, the adapter doc and kinase PYK2 in the cytoplasm of normal B cells. And the physiologic toll like receptor 9 activation uh, induces PYK2 mediated phosphorylation of the OK8, recruitment of CERC kinases, including the BCR associated LIN, and activation of the proximal BCR pathway component SIC. Therefore, evidencing the existence of a proximal level crosstalk in normal B cells. So to test if this was true also in the LBCL, we used the three uh, BCR-dependent cell lines with endogenous wildtap MyD88 and CD79B. And after activation of the toll-like receptor, we were able to detect also increased phosphorylation of the proximal BCR pathway component to seek and BDK. Therefore, revealing that this proximal level crosstalk between these two pathways also exists in the LBCL. Then to test the effect of the L265P mutation of MyD88 alone or in combination with the CD79B alteration, we engineered the same three wild types and lines to express a single or concurrent alterations. And as you can see from this Western blot, concurrent alteration, which are shown in purple, significantly increase both magnitude and duration of uh, the proximal BCR signaling. So we asked if uh, the OK plays a role in this oncogenic augmented uh, proximal BCR signaling. And since it has been shown in normal B cells that docate interacts with MyD88 and phosphodocate recruits lean, therefore bridging uh, the toll-like receptor and the B cell receptor pathways at the proximal level, we aimed at uh, understanding this interaction also in the LBCL cell lines and how the l 26 p mutation influences this interaction. And to do so, we use the proximity ligation assays which, uh, which determine protein-protein interactions in C2. And as you can see from these immunofluorescence images, the L265P mutation significantly increased the interaction of the OCATE with MyD88 and the OCATE with LIN. And we were also able to translate our findings from cell line to primary uh, samples from the LBCL patients. And as you can see, selectively uh, cluster five patients with a combination of MyD88 and CD79B alterations show increased interaction of DOC8 with MyD88. So we were wondering if DOC8 then plays a selective role in these MyD88 L265P enhanced proximal BCR signaling. And to test our hypothesis, we depleted the docate in cell lines that endogenously have wild type protein, proteins or endogenously carry a combination of these genetic alterations. And as you can see from this Western blot, the docate knockdown selectively decreases seek and BDK phosphorylation in mutant cell lines with little to no effect in wild type ones. Also, um, the Kate knockdown, which is here shown uh, in red, 
selectively inhibiting both proliferation and uh, viability of mutant cell lines with no impact in wild type ones. And very importantly, from a therapeutic point of view, the addition of docate depletion to BTK blockade with ibrutinib, which is shown in shades of red, significantly increases both the cytotoxic and the antiproliferative effect of ibrutinib alone, which is shown in green. So the conclusion for this first part, which we recently published in blood, is that the combination of these genetic alterations increases proximal visceral receptor signaling in the LBCL. And docate depletion selectively decreases proximal VCR signaling as well as proliferation and viability of cells expressing a combination of these genetic alterations, and more importantly, synergizes with chemical BTK inhibition. So we think that this mechanism might, at least in part, explain the increased sensitivity of cluster 5 DLBCLs to BTK blockade. And in the second part of the talk, I want to share some unpublished data regarding my work on uh, cluster 1 DLBCL. So B6 translocations are a distinctive feature of cluster 1 DLBCL, which also present multiple genetic bases of immune evasion, and among them, CD17 activating mutations are clearly the most frequent. CD70 is a ligand expressed on the surface of activated B cells and on certain malignant B cells. And binds is ligand CD27, which is expressed on the surface of T cells. The formation of this complex is a costimulatory signal which induces antigen-dependent T cell expansion and consequent immune surveillance of both normal and malignant B cells. So we postulated that the inactivating mutations of CD70 that we have detected in cluster 1 likely disrupt the CD70-CD27 interaction, and therefore they impair the T cell co-stimulation. And to test our hypothesis, we built a mouse model of B6 translocation together with CD70 loss, which I'm going to refer to as double uh, from now on in the presentation. And as you can see from these survival curves, uh, double mice uh, uh, show an earlier onset and uh, significantly increased the penetrance of BCR6 driven lymphomas. However, when we analyze uh, the spleen of mice utilized for symptoms of both BCR6 and the double cohorts, we detected massively enlarged spleens, histopathologically uh, confirmed the LBCLs, uh, presence of clonal rearrangements of the immunoglobulin genes, and the different degrees of T cell infiltration. But we were not able to detect any difference in the type of lymphoma that uh, the mice developed in presence or absence of CD70. So we decided to move one step back, and in order to map the progression towards uh, uh, the development of uh, aberrant uh, B cell lymphoproliferation and lymphomagenesis, as well as the parallel concurrent loss of the T cell uh, mediated immune response, we euthanized the asymptomatic animals at predetermined time points, and we focused our analysis on the on their spleen, since this is the main organ involved in lymphoma development. And as you can see from these representative HNE images, we were able to detect a greater uh, splenic white pulp expansion already at six months in double mice as compared to BCR6 animals. And this is followed by an earlier onset splenomegaly, again in double mice, with a greater uh, percentage of animals that already present uh, monoclonal rearrangements of their immunoglobulin genes. So these findings were suggesting an earlier loss of the T cell mediated immune response in the absence of CD17. And to gain a deeper understanding of our T cell subsets, uh, we performed the single cell RNA sequencing of 91 selected, sub selected samples and analyzed the CD8 and the CD4 T cells. And as you can see from this 
uh, UMAP, so we were able to detect the different populations of uh, both CD8 and CD4 T cells, and in particular also subsets of cytotoxic T cells, not only in the CD8 space, but also very interestingly in the CD4 space. And when we analyze the, the uh, T cell uh, TCR clonotypes in our mice, uh, we evidenced a very limited uh, um, clonal expansion of the CD8 uh, CTLs uh, and instead a much greater clonal expansion of the CD4 CTLs. Also, the CD4 CTL expansion seemed to be very selectively detected in BCR6 and double mice, but was absent in the control animals, which is indicative of a very specific uh, tumor response. And also, the clonal expansion that we detected was less prominent in double mice than it was in single animals over time, uh, therefore showing that the loss of CD70 impairs the capacity of these CTLs to um, expand and effectively target the, the tumor neoantigens. So the conclusion of this Second part, which I'm going to present in more detail at ASH in December, is that the absence of CD70 induces both earlier onset and also increased penetrance of BCL6 driven lymphomas, and that the impaired CD70 CD27 costimulation also results in an earlier loss of the T cell mediated anti tumor immune response, therefore suggesting a potential role for CD27 agonist antibodies in the therapy of cluster 1 DLBCLs. And altogether, my studies show that leveraging the knowledge of DLBCL genetic signature, we can really define rational single agent and combination therapies for patients with the, the greatest need. And with this, I want to thank my mentor, Margaret Schiff, uh, all the present and previous members of the SHIP Lab, all our collaborators at Dana Farber, Brigham and Women, HMS and the Broad Institute, our funding agencies, my family and my friends for always having been supportive and all of you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Elisa. And the presentation is uh, open for questions. Maybe I start again. Congratulations, first of all. This is a uh, truly nice work. I would have a lot of questions, but I think we have <laughs> restraints. So I'll only maybe ask two, one per project. The first one is I want, would like to hear from you or to know whether you also did the PALA with um, toll-like receptor 9 and whether how would you discuss these findings in the context of the mighty BCR complex so that, as you know, these proteins uh, can make in, in tumor cells. And the second question in fact, instead is related to the mouse model. I, I think you have a constitutional knockout there for CD70. Uh, so um, does that, um, do you think that may affect, uh, I didn't see the phenotype of the tumor. So, so would that affect the, the more, you know, the features, the markers so that they characterize these tumors so that developed? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. These are both very good questions. So um, regarding the answer of the first question, um, I didn't have time to show them, but we also performed some other uh, PLAs with uh, LAMP1, which is the marker of the uh, endolysosomes in which uh, the NCI group that previously has described this mighty super complex has identified the um, as the location where the interaction between the, the toll-like receptor, the B cell receptor, and MyD88 interact. And we were able to detect a colocalization of MyD88 with OK8 and OK8 with LAMP1 uh, in wild type cell lines. And this was increased in presence of the L265 mutation. So uh, what was not really shown in the papers before is that uh, the colocalization happens intracellularly near the the endolysosomes, but it doesn't uh, happen downstream at the level of an FKB. It happens really proximally at the level of DOC8 and MyD88. So 
We did not uh, check in particular the, the toll like receptor 9, but uh, we evidenced uh, starting from the previously published data that that might be the, the mechanism. So we anticipate that uh, we would see also colocalization of uh, DOC8 with uh, the toll like receptor, yes. And to answer to the second question, uh, yes, we detected in uh, um, our model, uh, we um, focused in our model on the spleen and uh, we checked the uh, expression of CD70 and CD27 by flow cytometry on the surface of the B and T cells. And we detected the selective expression of CD27 on CD4 and CD8 T cells, as well as NK cells. But CD27 was absent on the surface of myeloid cells, neutrophils, dendritic cells, and also uh, on the B cells of the mice that were utilized for symptoms. So we think that even if uh, the knockout is a constitutive knockout uh, in, in regarding uh, what we are analyzing in this lymphoma and the interaction, uh, the specific interaction of CD70 and CD27, even if uh, CD70 is not uh, present also in other cell types, uh, this does not impact uh, the uh, binding with CD27 because the receptor is just not uh, there. That's excellent. Maybe one last question. Do your tumors recapitulate the phenotype of the C1? I mean, I know that that's a genetic subgroup, but mm -hmm. do you have markers that you can could link to that subtype? Yeah, yeah. They are probably ABC, phenotypically, I yeah, think C1 yeah, are yeah. mostly. So your tumors were recapitulating the phenotype of those. Yes, yeah, they're basically all uh, IRF4 uh, and they recapitulate the um, characteristics of cluster one. However, the picture is very complicated and we are still trying to decipher these uh, RNA-seq data also because this ABC type is not like cluster five uh, clearly derived from uh, plasma blasts that uh, transit to the germinal center, but we were postulating an extra follicular origin of these tumors. So we are also working on analyzing uh, through single cell, which I didn't have time to show the B cells uh, and uh, to try and understand what could be the putative uh, cell of origin, if there is really an extra follicular origin of these tumors. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think uh, we have enough questions from Laura, unless Simona has question on others. I don't see from others. No question, but it's a really a terrific work. Really terrific. Congratulations. Very nice. I second that, uh, Elisa. Congratulations. And thank you. thank you very much. Then we'll move to the next uh, talk. Thank you. The next talk will be Eugenio Morelli, lead scientist, also at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, unlocking the therapeutic potential of non-coding RNAs in multiple myeloma. Eugenio. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, before starting, I really would like to thank the organizers and the scientific committee for this amazing opportunity to be today among the, uh, the finalists and in a such good company. And uh, one of the most exciting discoveries in the last decades has been that our genome is pervasively transcribed and the derived transcription is only in a little part uh, meant to produce protein while the vast majority is non-protein coding. And this uh, discovery triggered an extensive research in the field that at its beginning mainly focused on microRNA that are today widely recognized as important regulator of the protein output by working at post-transcriptional level. And uh, we also gave our contribution in the field by exploring the biological and therapeutic role of microRNA in multiple myeloma, resulting in one of the first clinical trials with a microRNA inhibitor. More recently, uh, we shifted, I shifted my, uh, my focus from uh, microRNA to long non-coding RNA that are among the most enigmatic molecule in molecular biology. 
Uh, long non coding RNA can make up uh, the 80% of the human transcriptome. They, of course, lack a protein coding activity and are simply defined by a length longer than 200 nucleotides. From the few public, from the few long non coding that have been uh, functionally and biochemically characterized, we know that this molecule can interact uh, with other with this, this long can interact with other macromolecules, including DNA, RNA, or protein, uh, affecting their function and thus uh, impacting virtually any biological uh, process, including tumorigenesis. In multiple myeloma, there has been a, a thorough, the, the expression of long non coding RNA has been thoroughly uh, profiled. What we know, for example, is that they can make even more than the 80% of the transcriptome, and this, and this long non coding are differentially expressed in myeloma compared to normal plasma cells. And uh, so, suggesting a potential role in uh, myeloma genesis. We and others have also identified the uh, signature of long non-coding RNA that can predict uh, the outcome of myeloma patients and can uh, well integrate in the current prognostic system, uh, such as the MRD uh, status, uh, complementing it. Uh, in this field, my main contribution has been to explore their functional role. And in the last years, I mainly focus on uh, this non-coding RNA, the MIR-70HG. This gene was known to produce a cluster of six microRNA um, called MIR-1792 that uh, was with oncogenic potential in different cancer contexts. What we found in myeloma is that uh, this cluster of microRNA uh, works within the uh, MIC, trans the MIC uh, uh, transcriptional program, um, <clears throat> down-regulating a propoptotic pathway that is a safe, uh, a safe mechanism that cells uh, a trigger to uh, induce apoptosis upon uh, mic cap regulation, thus demonstrating, thus demonstrating that this microRNA uh, help myeloma cells to tolerate uh, mic overexpression that is one of the main driver in multiple myeloma. Uh, more recently, what we found was also that this uh, gene can be alternatively spliced to produce a, a novel transcript that we call LINK1792. And that in, at least in multiple myeloma, we prove to be the main determinant of the oncogenic potential at this locus. From a mechanistic point of view, we found that LINK1792 can directly interact uh, with, the, uh, with DNA, a specific gene loci, uh, providing a chromatin scaffold for MIC and other, uh, for MIC to bind with other transcriptional co-regulators forming a novel uh, ribonucleoprotein complex that activates a metabolic signal called uh, uh, lipogenesis that is essential for the survival of myeloma cells. Moreover, we also developed strategies for its therapeutic targeting. Uh, going more in, on details in this part, what we did, it's very challenging to target long non coding RNA to handle antisense oligonucleotides, and to address this challenge, we developed a platform to optimize antisense inhibitor of long non coding RNA. This platform uh, is based on three steps. First step is meant to identify with a tiling approach the most accessible, accessible RNA stretches on link RNA. Second step is meant to sequence optimize this uh, antisense inhibitor. And the last step is meant to conjugate this inhibitor with lipid moieties to improve the bioavailability and in vivo activity. Through this approach, we developed two inhibitor to leading compounds, one that can block the activity of the long non coding, the second one that can induce its degradation. We proved that both inhibitors have a strong antimyeloma activity in different, uh, in different animal models that included the plasma cytoma model, a very aggressive disseminated animal model, and also a patient-derived uh, uh, model of myeloma, where our inhibitor proved to, proved to be as effective as bortezomib in um, antagonizing myeloma cell growth, with bortezomib being uh, the reference drug in this disease. So on this basis, my overarching hypothesis is that long non coding RNA are drivers and targets in multiple myeloma. And uh, to address my hypothesis, 
the initial the initial question, of course, are which long known coding from automatic myeloma with more than 30,000 that are annotated and only few of them that have been functionally characterized. And of course, also what are the key molecular features? Why this information is still missing in an era where functional genomics has provided already all this information for protein coding genes. The reason is that the approach that have been developed for protein coding genes don't work or work or very poor in, uh, in working on long known coding RNA for different reasons. So <clears throat> in addressing this issue, what we did was to capitalize a, a recent discovery, the recent discovery of the CRISPR Cas13 Cas13 um, protein. Cas13, differently from Cas9, uh, targets RNA for degradation without affecting DNA. So we reasoned that this could be the ideal tool to systematically characterize a functional long known coding RNA. What we did was to develop an innovative approach that we named CRISPR-based functional transcriptomics. In this approach, of course, we this approach of course takes advantage of the RNA targeting activity of Cas13 in combination with libraries of guide RNA that target a long known coding RNA at a genome wide scale. We used this library in uh, myeloma cells, in different myeloma cells, to perform dropout viability screen, which can inform on what, on which long known coding RNA supports myeloma cell growth and also in combination with single cell RNA sequencing to inform about the molecular pathway that are controlled by long known coding RNA in a systematic way. The first discovery that we made was quite surprising because the dependence on long known coding RNA is much broader than expected. We identified up to 600 long known coding RNA that, are, that we call tumor promoting long known coding RNA that are essential for the survival of myeloma cells. More than half of this long known coding were essential for at least two myeloma cell lines and <clears throat> more than 100 for all the cell lines that have been tested. So independently of the uh, molecular, uh, of the genomic background. How strong is the dependency on, on long known coding RNA? Even here where the discovery was very surprising because in our screen, we found many long known coding RNA that could provide a dependency that was on a par or even superior to the positive control that were included in the screen. Here I'm showing IRF4 that is widely recognized as the strongest uh, dependency myeloma among protein coding genes. Another important finding was also that this tumor promoting long known coding RNA could not be predicted using comparative genomics or transcriptomics. In the example that I'm showing here, uh, we found that the, uh, there was not a correlation between the expression of long known coding and the dependency score in the screen, meaning that even very lowly expressed long known coding RNA, that can mean even one or two transcripts per cells can provide a very strong dependency. Then, after identifying the tumor promoting long known coding, we uh, aim to localize their site of action in myeloma cells. How? By combining a localization study, in particular subcellular RNA sequencing that can localize the relative expression in three different compartments, with the use of Cas13 that was engineered to be uh, specifically expressed in the nuclear or cytosolic compartment. In myeloma cells expressing this Cas13, we infected uh, with our library of guide RNA. And as expected, what we found was that the most of the tumor promoting long known coding RNA that were previously identified were acting in the nuclear fraction. And in the example that I'm showing here, RMRP was one of the top dependents in the screen that also showed an exquisite localization in the, nu in the nuclear fraction. And by single molecule RNA fish, we could also demonstrate that it's specifically localized in cell nucleoli, so a biomolecular condensate within uh, cell nucleo nu nuclei. On the other side, we were also able to identify a number of long known coding that act in the cytosol, 
uh, here highlighted in red, one of them uh, that was the top candidate in the screen for, for, one, for this uh, SNG6, we also confirmed the expression in the cytosolic compartment by RNA sequencing and also by single molecule RNA fish. Why this information is important? Because it can lead the um, molecular investigation on, on long non coding RNA. What we expect is that long non coding that provide dependency in, and act in cell nucleoli may be involved in transcriptional or co transcriptional events with the long non coding RNA that are in the cytosol being involved in other cellular processes. Moreover, uh, the targeting strategy that are available uh, at the moment can also clearly discriminate long non coding that, act in, that work in the cytosol uh, and in the uh, cytoplasm. So this information will also guide the therapeutic uh, investigation on this molecule. Uh, next, what we did was to, um, what we asked was whether this long non coding RNA were tumor promoting only multiple myeloma or also in other cancer context. And we focused on the long non coding RNA that uh, showed the strongest dependency myeloma. We generated a validation library and applied this uh, validation library to other, um, to myeloma, but also to other uh, cancer cell lines from different origin. Uh, what we found was again surprising because most of this long non coding RNA seems to be universal dependency. So they are essential for the growth of not, not just the myeloma, but also the other cancer. On the other side, we also were able to identify some myeloma specific or preferential dependency. And for example, for one of them uh, that we named PLASP1, plasma cell specific long non coding RNA we also demonstrated a specific expression in normal or uh, uh, malignant plasma cells, but was not detectable in any other uh, cellular context. And we are currently working to uh, decode its mechanism. Uh, finally, uh, this is ongoing. We, are, we, don't, we, are, we haven't completed this, this study yet. So we are trying to define the transcriptional states associated with uh, the knockdown of this long non coding RNA in a systematic manner to guide the functional investigation. Uh, to this end, we couple the uh, CRISPR screen to single cell RNA sequencing. And what I can share uh, at the moment is that we were successful. Uh, we were successful in detecting, co-detecting at single cell level the expression of the guide RNA and the expression of endogenous RNA. In this example. For, uh, here we have cells that express the guide RNA for MALAT1 that also show a, a down regulation of this long non coding RNA. And in these cells, we also detected the alteration of biological processes such as splicing of unfolded protein response that are consistent with what we know about MALAT1. In conclusion, what we found. Uh, with, this, with, with our work, we, are, we, we have replied to one of the, our initial questions. So which long non coding RNA promotes multiple myeloma? Uh, we will disseminate this data to a public portal to streamline the research in the field. We strongly believe that this is the foundation to unlock the therapeutic potential. And of course, the next step will be to prioritize the most uh, important targets, decode their mechanism, and develop uh, strategies for uh, the therapeutic targeting. And I would like to thank all of you for the attention, but I also would like to thank all the people that are working in my group, especially Dr. Maisano that is focusing on the cas project. All the people from my uh, mentor lab, of course, on top of them, my mentor, Nikhil Mushi, Dr. Akhtar Samur that is taking care of the bioinformatic analysis and of the uh, web portal, and all the society that have been funding my uh, fellowship and my research so far, and I'm I'm happy to uh, take questions. Thank you very much, Eugenio. Excellent presentation. Uh, open for questions. It's a myeloma talk, and I expect Simona will be the first. You're muted, Simona. Yeah. I'm actually very surprised, not surprised, but uh, so, you know, I, I've, my career was made on uh, multiple myeloma. Now I completely switch field and I'm working on MDS, but uh, still uh, I remember something. We are finishing uh, the last paper and then for, 
I will forget my Loma. But uh, this uh, one thing, uh, uh, I was surprised that, not surprised, but I always uh, got interest in a Malatuan. Oh. This is something uh, that I always observe as well by myself to be very highly overexpressed. Uh, so can you explain me better how it could be the reason why, what, what do you think about uh, this uh, Malatuan? And uh, what are you, um, what do you think to do in future? I'm sorry. So I um, I don't have a specific right now interest in Malatuan was just an example, but mm. you are right. Malatuan is so interesting. It's one of the most famous long non coding RNA. We know in our, in our, from our sequencing that is among the, uh, the RNA with the highest expression in general. It's not overexpressed in myeloma versus normal plasma cells for a reason. It's already very highly expressed in normal plasma cells. The reason we don't know, we don't know yet. In a previous paper uh, from my um, lab when I was in Italy, uh, we demonstrated that this uh, long non coding can transcriptionally control uh, the expression of proteasome subunits. So promoting their expression, uh, this can be an explanation why plasma cells that also need a, a lot of proteasomal activity uh, express such high level of malat one. But this is just a speculation. In generally speaking, in every tissue, malat one is really really ubiquitous. To ubiquitous, yeah. it's highly expressed in uh, any tissue. The the interesting thing it's it is that. It seems that it's important for the survival of cancer cells, not for normal cells. Any, more, any, any uh, mice can survive even without malat one. Very good. I mean, it's an impressive work. I I, I I saw your career and I saw your publication and uh, I know very well uh, your group. Uh, and congratulations. I cannot say that uh, than other than congratulations because it's an amount of work that is uh, really incredible in the last uh, six years uh, in Boston you made. Thank you. So, Eugenio, so you at the end of the talk, you, you sort of screened for um, long non coding RNA that are uh, expressed specifically in myeloma and in normal plasma cells, right? So uh, how many did you find that is anyone that is specific for myeloma so top, as opposed to normal plasma cells? So uh, unfortunately, our functional screen cannot include normal plasma cells because uh, even, we can even not include uh, plasma cells from patients because plasma cells do not survive long-term culture and cannot be engineered. So what we found here is that when I mean, when I said myeloma cell preferential or specific, I meant that these are dependency in myeloma cells, not in the other cancer cells that we tested in our screen. And in this specific example, this novel long run coding RNA that we named PLASPA, PLASPA1, we also found very interesting that it is highly expressed in normal and malignant plasma cells, but it's not detectable or really poorly expressed in uh, in uh, in the other normal tissue. So we believe that this can be a very attractive target because uh, it, for its uh, selective expression in plasma cells. Okay. You have a like in side to hybridization um, technology that can allow you to quickly assess the normal pattern of expression of your selected long non coding. So we have all the transcript transcriptomics that are available in normal and malignant plasma cells with poly A enriched RNA, but also total RNA that is very important for long non coding RNA. So we have in when I, I, I didn't mention for the sake of the time, but for all the long non coding that we have characterized, we have the clinical functional molecular information already available. We uh, almost finished this work, and this will be uh, made available to everyone uh, to uh, streamline the research. For example, in this example, uh, this long non coding RNA is 
more expressed in patient with deletion of 17p compared to the others. So all the, all the, all this information will be made available when we have them. Okay. Any other question? I don't see any. So the I think the symposium can conclude here. I thank you very much, uh, the speakers. Uh, very interesting presentations uh, generate a lot of interest. And thank you very much to the members of the jury and all the support uh, uh, and leadership from ISNAF. And uh, thank you very much to all of you. This, this webinar is closed.